to our resurrected Savior who is alive and doing well. And to you, my brothers and sisters who are related to me by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank God that once again, he has allowed us this opportunity to get into his word, to be able to hear what it is that he has to say to his people. I once again want to thank God for you, Sanctuary, and I want to thank God for Pastor Lester for allowing me this opportunity to share from the greatest book that I know, and that is the word of God. And so here we are once again, as we prepare to close out another period in our history, a period that we are said so dear to me, that being Black History Month. I want to thank God that he has allowed us this, this time and allowed us this time of sharing the space of just reflecting on where God has kept us and God has taken us as a people. I personally believe that Black History Month should not be just tailored to just, just the month of February, but I think, this is, I think it's important that we take time to celebrate and we commemorate what the, the many accomplishments that we have had as a people all year long. And so I just want to thank God for this time. And I want to thank God that he has allowed us this time of reflection. But I want to encourage each and every one of you not just to take this moment in the month of February, not just to look at this time of how we've come over by, uh, come over tough, rough terrains and became successful as black men, and uh, African-American women. But I want, I want to challenge you to really take time to really educate yourself and really take time to reflect on it all year long. You know, we as a people, God has protected us. And I'm not discrediting anything from my, my brothers and sisters who, um, who are Caucasian or Asian or anyone else. I'm not saying that. Um, but what I am saying is that uh, what I am saying is, is that as, as African-Americans, God has kept us and we have come a mighty long way. And so I just want to take that moment just to, 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 to congratulate each and every one of us and challenge each and every one of us to take time to really reflect on the many accomplishments and the many things that we have, went, we have been through and overcame throughout our whole history. Let's prepare to get into the word of God. Um, as you know, and as you know, Pastor Lester has been taking us through the life of Joshua and say, and as going through the life of Joshua, we've learned so many things. We learned some practical things that really even applies to our lives. Last time he got, we, we came together. He took us through various principles as Joshua and the people of Israel begin to make go into a crossover. And so we want to continue to continue to go through that theme and we want to continue to go through um, that period in history where Joshua used, where God used Joshua and the many soldiers to help the children of Israel to prepare to go into a crossover, to go into an area that was unbeknownst to them. I'm sure each and every one of us can relate to that. Because sometimes God would take us to periods where we had literally, where he literally is desiring to shift us. And there's various things that you and I have to learn before we go into that different area of our lives. So let's start out with the word of prayer and then we're going to get into the word of God. Let's pray. Our Father and God, once again, we pause, Father, to thank you to praise you and honor you, God, for another opportunity to get into your word. We ask, Lord God, that you would speak to us and give us, Lord God, what it is that we need so that we can become better servants for you. Speak, Father, because your, your servants are listening. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look into the word of God as we prepare. Let's prepare to go into the word of God. We're going to look at the book of Joshua. We're going to go back with Joshua chapter 3, starting at verse number 1. It says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Achaia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel. 
and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days after that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself or consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. As you recall, for many years, the children of Israel has waited for God to take them to the place known as the Promised Land. This place was promised to them and has been in their minds since they were told about this covenant made by the forefather, Abraham. And here it is after years of being in captivity under Pharaoh in Egypt and living as mere slaves, their faith has literally diminished and their hope has been lost. History tells us that many of the children of Israel died in Egypt. And those who did survive later had died in the wilderness. Yet before they passed on, they were always told about this promised land that was promised to them. Now, you can't help but to think that even some of the elderly and the sickly individuals literally at a certain point lost their faith. Because at this, they lost their faith at a particular moment. Because for so many years, they were told about this promise. But it didn't look like it was going to happen. Well, maybe not soon enough in their eyes. The frustration was they did not know when they was going, when they would make it to this promised land. Nor they didn't know how they were going to get there. But despite the ailments and the discomfort that they were facing, they had to put their trust in God and believe that sooner or later, God would take them to where he promised them. I'm sure some, some of us, even right now, can relate to just how those individuals felt during that time. Because some of us have been in positions where, they, where we know without a shadow of a doubt, God has promised certain things to us. But based upon how things are looking at that particular moment in our lives, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so now we're here, here it is, after centuries of believing and waiting, the Israelites are now at the point in their lives where they're making preparations to cross to that promised land. There's an atmosphere, you picture it, there's an atmosphere of celebration and, and excitement and enthusiasm all in the air. People are smiling and joyous because a moment ago, it didn't appear like they were going to make it. The one who has led them thus far, Moses, has led them up to a certain point, according to the word of God, and now suddenly... He has passed on. And so before God had told him that he would not go into this promised land, Moses had passed the baton to his young predecessor, Joshua. Joshua in chapter one has a conversation with God and God specifically tells Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Don't mourn no more. Because what I promise you that I'm going to do, I'm still going to do it. I'm sure at that particular moment, Joshua was excited because sometimes, and based upon how things look in our lives, sometimes, even though we know God 
is all perfect and all knowing. Sometimes we literally do feel like God has forgotten us. And so at this moment, just like Joshua, you and I feel refreshed when we hear that God tells us that what I promise I'm going to do, what I promise I'm going to do to you, what I promise what I'm going to do for your family, it shall now, it will come to pass. And so God said, I have still made preparation for the people to take them to a place that has already been prepared. Isn't it amazing how when you and I are waiting for God to do what he say he's going to do for us, what is amazing is, one, he not only doesn't forget us, but two, he's already behind the scenes making preparations for the land, making preparations for the individuals we come in contact with so that when we do so that when we do prepare to go to where God is taking us it goes smooth sail that's how God operates in our lives and so now that Moses has died God said I'm going to use you Joshua to take them to that place I'm going to use you because I'm sovereign no, I didn't pick Aaron, which only seems to be more appropriate in our eyes, but I chose you, Joshua. So be strong and courageous because no one will be able to stand against you. No one will be able to destroy you. No one be, will be able to take you down because I'm with you. And the one thing that I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you, to meditate on my word. And if you meditate upon my word, you would have good success. I'm not going to sit and reinvent the wheel based upon what Pastor Lester has already said. Because Pastor Lester laid out various principles, even evolving around this one particular verse in chapter one. But what I do want to tell you is this, is that according to the word of God, God gives us a simple formula that he has guaranteed we're in in, being success, in in our success. And what that basically says is found in verse number three. He says, meditate on my word day and night. Then you will have good success. Brothers and sisters, the reason why God is telling us to meditate on our on his word day and night and then we will have good success is that that is related to our personal attention when we keep our attention specifically on what god says and we keep our attention on his word what that does is that it eliminates distractions in our lives we literally do not be, be begin to pay attention to the fiery darts that Satan would try to throw at us. Because when we focus on a word day and night, then what that basically suggests is that that is where all of our attention is. It doesn't mean things aren't going to go on around us. Things will always happen around us. But our focus, our attention should be specifically on his word. And when we pay attention to his word, then of course, as he said, we will have good success. So Joshua, here it is, feeling a sense of encouragement. Joshua then starts to make preparation to take the people to the promised land and promise them that in three days, according to God's word, we're going to possess this land. However, in order for them to go and to possess the land, they have to cross over the Jordan River. In other words, before we can get what God has for us, we must face the obstacles that is before us. <laughs> I'm sure you can see the smiles and cheers on their faces immediately. Now all of a sudden turn to frown and worry. Because in order for the people to get to the promised land, they have to face the Jordan River. See, according to the time of the text, the Jordan River was filled up to the banks. 
The Jordan River was a liter was literally 150 to 180 feet in width and 300 to 360 feet in depth. So from the naked eye, this task seemed impossible. But in order to get to the land that God had for them, God has literally put them in a position where they had to face the shakiness and the uneasiness of their faith. And regardless of how they felt, the people was expected to face it. They was expected to face it because you too can go, you can't, you too far because they were too far to go back to Egypt. You know, it's in us, it's innate within us that when we feel any pressures in life, it's easy for us to retreat to go back. Because when we go back, we seem to find safety in going back all of a sudden because we're already accustomed to those things that are behind us. But God places us in positions where we can't even go back. Because just like in this case, the people of Israel could not go back because if they went back, things would be worse for them than before they even left in the first place. So they literally had, they was literally put in a position where they had to buckle down and face what is before them because Joshua said they're gone in three days. Isn't that just like God? To, 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 to place us in a peculiar situation and give us this type of outcome. You know, we love the outcome. We love the, the fact of being able to sing and praise God and have the celebration and rejoicing. We love all that. But live, isn't it just like God not to tell us about what's going to go on in between? The place where he puts us in positions where we literally have to face our fears and face our worry and face our hesitations. And here it is with uncertainty. We still have to face this, yet at the same time still have a praise of hallelujah. Isn't that just like God? To put us in a position where we're literally in a holding pattern, where we're stuck in between, two situations. A situation that is behind us is a lot more tougher than what than what we can really handle at this point. And then our situation that is before us, it is complete uncertainty. And so we're now stuck in the middle where we now have to make these major decisions in our lives. And part of making the decision, it challenges us, God challenges us to face our personal anxiety and face our personal fears. One of the things that I've learned, my brothers and sisters, is that one of the things I've learned is that God has prepared us as individuals to handle what is only going on at that particular moment. We can only handle what is going, we can only handle and deal with our now. What I mean by that is we can't deal with what is before us, because what is before us never occurred. That's God's job. We can't deal with what is behind us, because what is behind us is now behind us. But what we can deal with is that we can deal with our present. And sometimes where we struggle at as brothers and sisters, as human beings, is that we get so stuck on the things that worrying about the things that is either before us or the things that are already behind us when we really should be focusing on our present situation. Because in our present situation, God puts us there in our present to be able to handle the present so that we can go ahead and go to the future. So where the people were at, at that particular moment, Joshua told them, we're moving in three days. They couldn't do nothing about that. What they could do is deal with their present moment. They could deal with their worry. They could deal with their fears. They could deal with their hesitations. They could deal with all that. And the way that they deal with it 
is that they get into the face of God. God gave them the formula, gave Joshua the formula to give to the people in verse 3. Meditate on my word day and night. Then you will have good success. And this is where we sometimes struggle. If we want to get past our current problems, if we want to get to where God wants to take us, the only thing that you and I have to focus on is our present. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Not tomorrow. But this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it, which means I will be rejoice and be glad at this present moment. That's what I can handle. And so here it is. The people are stuck where they literally have to focus on dealing with their fears and their hesitations. Faith is not based on. Upon you always knowing the details. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Here it is. And the evidence of things that are not seen. Which means this. I don't always have to have the evidence. On how God is going to provide. I just got to believe that he's going to provide. I can't always tell you the steps of my blessings. But I can tell you that I've been blessed. And the reason why I can tell you that is because God will sometimes keep the details from us, but he expects us to focus on the truth. And so our faith is being challenged when we in these situations before we go into these crossovers. And our faith is what is going to help us to keep focus when I don't even know what I'm looking for. It helps us. It challenges us. It challenges us that even when I don't know what I'm looking for, it challenges us and encourages us to press on. And so the people of God is at this moment. Joshua said, we will cross this Jordan River. Look at how God helps. In order for them to cross over to the Jordan River, their focus must be intact. And what God does in this particular text is that he gives them what they need to focus on in order to get over the Jordan River. And what he gives them is that he gives them, he wants them to focus on the ark. Now, historically speaking, the ark is Israel's prized possession. And, and, and in this ark, there are treasures. It contains the Ten Commandments. It contains Aaron's rod. And it contains a jar of manna. Each and everything that is in this ark is a reflection of what God has done for them in the past. And so as they begin to continue to focus on how God helped them overcome their paths, it's going to literally help them and encourage them in their present situation. This is the reason why, my brothers, we have such things as Black History Month. Because Black History Month is not just a period where we really focus on and we get excited and happy because of what happened in our past as African Americans. What it's designed for is that when we see the historicity, historicity of, of, of African Americans and how God has kept us and how God has protected us, it's supposed to help us in our current situation. This is why we need, you need to understand about the importance of really getting to understand what happened in the past. Because all these things that happened in the past it literally is designed to help us in our current situation. You should feel more, uh, you should feel more encouraged when you think about what God has done for us, how God has kept people like Rosa Parks, how God has kept people such as those that was like Martin Luther King, how God has kept people even like 
Malcolm X and and, and and the list goes on and on and how he kept them throughout tough times and, and Nelson Mandela while he was in jail, how he kept them through tough times. And if God can do that for them, why can't he do it for us? And so that's what this is all about. And so in the ark, you see Aaron's rod. You see a jar of manna. And you see the Ten Commandments. God gave them something that they can focus on and that will remind them of his presence during this crossover. So the ark is there to symbolize God's presence. In Exodus 25, 22, after God gave descriptions of the appearance of the ark, he said, at the ark, I will meet you and I will speak to you because you were experienced my presence. In other words, when you are preparing to cross over to the place where God is going to take you, if you focus on him, you will be literally begin to experience his presence. If you focus on the Lord, if you focus on what God has said in his word, if you focus on, if you focus on his, on, on, on the word of God, focus on what it is that he has to say, you will literally begin to experience, have a supernatural experience of literally a feeling his presence. Because, and what happens is when you feel his presence, God then gives you peace, even in the presence of your situation. You know, one of the things that we want, we want the situation to be removed. But sometimes God would not remove the situation. God will help us in the midst of the situation. And so even if the storms of life are still raging, as the songwriter said, God is able to help you. And help your soul to be anchored. And you will be anchored in the Lord if you focus on his word. So the ark is there. And so when you that what he's saying is when you focus on the ark, you will begin to experience his presence. Notice what begins to happen. The moment you begin to experience his presence. The, you experience his presence, the end result is peace. And peace gives joy. Notice I didn't say happiness. I said joy. Because happiness is external. Joy is internal. Happiness can change in the midst of your circumstances. Joy is everlasting. Happiness can fluctuate depending upon the person. Joy is divine. And so when you begin to focus on him, when you begin to focus on the word of God, God in the end not only gives you peace, but he then gives you joy. This is what happens when you focus on the ark. And so the ark symbolizes God's presence. But not only the ark symbolizes God's presence, but the ark symbolizes God's power. Joshua said, when you begin to focus on the ark, follow it from a distance. Look at the text. Look at the text. The text says, verse, chapter 3, verse number 4. It says, yet there will be a space between you and it. Here it is about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go. You have not passed this way before. Joshua said, when you begin to focus on the ark, follow it from a distance. He said, keep a distance of 1,000 yards because the ark is sacred. And the ark exemplifies God's power. When God is preparing to cross us over, when God is preparing to do a new thing in our lives, 
when God is preparing to do something that is different, God has a way of showing us just how powerful he really is. The text tells us, for in God's power is God's glory. And God's glory is awesome. Because when the Israelites prepared to receive the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 19, even in that text, they had to keep a distance because of the glory of God. When Moses wanted to see God's glory, he couldn't handle seeing all of his glory. So according to the word of God, God had to place him in the cleft of a rock. And even in the cleft of a rock, even then, he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle seeing God's glory. So he had to, he allowed him to see a piece of God's glory. For the heavens declares the glory of God. And the angels declare his glory. And all day, all night, they cry out, holy, holy, holy. For the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth, earth is filled with his glory. As a matter of fact, when your light shines before men, they begin to see the glory of God. God's glory shows his power. So not only does the ark show the presence of God, and not only does the ark show his power, but the ark shows his pathway. He said, keep a distance so you'll know which way to go. Keep a distance so you know which way to take. Because the reason why he say that is that sometimes if we're not careful, we'll go the way that we think we're supposed to go in life. And it's not the correct way. And so out of our own personal anxiety and fear and our own selfishness, we sometimes think that we know better than the Lord. And we try to go the way that we think is best. But God said, when you focus on this ark, when you focus on me, I'll show you the correct pathway. In this case, the path was the Jordan River. And it looked deep and impossible. But if you have faith in God's presence, what Joshua was saying, if you have faith in God's presence, if I have faith in God's power, then my faith will direct my path. So I can't worry how I'm going to get there. I can't worry about the outcome if I focus on his presence. And then he will direct my path. You know, I never forget this as long as I live. There, I, was, I used to take the train to work. And every day I used to take the train. I used to always see this gentleman every single day. I would see this gentleman. And the gentleman was blind. And so he would be going to work same time just like me. And so he would get on the train. And so he would get on the train. He would sit there. And so his stop would come up. And so as his stop began to come up, he would raise up and he would begin to walk towards the exit. Now, if you're like me, the first thing I want to do is that I want to go to assist the gentleman. But the gentleman would not take my assistance because the gentleman had his own guard dog. It was interesting I began to notice that even though I began, I and other people would try to give him some direction as to the way they think he should go, he would not pay attention to each and every one of us because he had the dog that was with him. And he put all his faith and trust in the dog. Because he knew the dog was going to take him to the right down the right path. Now, it doesn't mean that we wasn't trying to take him the right path. But the path that we were trying to take him was not the path that he wanted, that he was supposed to go. Because the, God, the, dark, the, 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 the dog didn't take him that way. That's how God want us. Because the ark, what he's basically saying is that the ark is there to direct doing the correct path. That even though things may look certain ways, and we think we may supposed to go down a certain path, what God was saying, if you focus on the ark 
it's going to take you down the right path. So since the ark represents his presence and since the ark represents his power and since the ark represents our path, then what he basically says is I must now prepare myself for this crossover. He said, consecrate yourself. For tomorrow, I'm going to do a miracle for you. What does this word mean? Consecrate yourself. God says, sanctify yourself. What, what, what does that mean? Sanctify or consecration relates back to the word of separation. God, what God is basically saying is that before I want you to do, before I do what it is that I promise I'm going to do for you, what I want you to do is that I want you to go to a period of separation. I want you to disconnect from the familiar, whether it be the friends, whether it be your, uh, uh, the things that of your enjoyment. I want you to separate from all of that. I'm going to do what I'm going to do for you. I want you to separate from that. Because the reason why I want you to separate from that is because where guy I'm trying to take you, some things don't need to go. And this is the challenge where many of us, where, where many of us either move forward or we bail out. Because sometimes what God is trying to challenge us is that he wants to take us part of the crossover. Is that wherever he wants to take us, he already got it planned. But in order for us to go there, some things we need to separate from. Maybe one of the things you need to separate from is bad habits. Oh, you know those habits. Some things are just not beneficial or conducive to your growth. Or maybe it has to be certain individuals. Maybe what God is trying to challenge you at is that some people are not there to help you to grow. Rather, they're there to help you to go backwards, to become a hindrance, to become a stumbling block to your growth. Sometimes God wants us to separate from individuals in our lives. And that's hard, especially when we've been with these individuals for long periods of time. We may have grown up with them. But in order for us to move to where God wants us to go, sometimes we have to come to a point where we have to realize that this is where the road ends. I was watching just the other day, there's a new sitcom that's out called Bel Air. And it's basically a spinoff from Will Smith's Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And so if you remember the story, there was a certain point where Will Smith was literally snatched out of West Philadelphia, where he was born and raised, where on the playground he spent most of his days. He was snatched out of there and he was sent out to Bel-Air, California, where he stayed with his uncle and aunt, who's doing very well. While there, they gave him the opportunity to experience life from a different perspective. He was getting a better education. He was getting, and he was getting safety. He was experiencing a different form of life, different environment, not just because of finances, but mentally, he was able to see another aspect of the world that he never saw. And so in the series, one of his closest friends from West Philadelphia came out to visit him. He came out and visited him and they was uh, excited because of how Will was now living. Living in a mad, fine mansions and greatest clothing and so forth. But at a certain point, he tried to challenge him and say, the individual that was giving you trouble in West Philadelphia is no longer there. 
So now you can come back to where you were at. Will had to make a conscientious decision. Do I return to where I was and be with the friends that was out I was with before? Doesn't mean that they wasn't good guys. They were great guys. Or do I stay where I'm at and move forward and look at the opportunities that God has presented for me? The two young men begin to get into a disagreement. They get into a little altercation. The friend from West Philly said, you ain't down. You done changed up. You not the same guy. You're fake. You're phony. You, you this and that. Will was trying to explain to him. He said, no. He said, I think I'm experiencing a different life that I've never experienced before. And I think I want to stay. The friend is going back and forth and calling him all type of names. And so Will, at that particular moment, he began to realize that sometimes as friends, we can ad agree to disagree. And maybe this is where this role ends. He literally had to make a conscientious decision. A decision where he, consecration came into play. Do I go back to where I was for the sake of being connected with my friends, with the guy, with the brother that I was with all this time? Or do I separate myself and stay here where I'm at to be able to take advantage of the opportunity that's presented to me. He had to make a decision. He couldn't call on his aunt, he couldn't call on his uncle, couldn't call on his mother. But he had to make the decision for himself. And so, of course, at the end of the series, at the end of the show, the friend went back to Philadelphia, upset. Sad. Will sat there as the car began to pull off with tears rolling down his eyes. Because he knew that the relationship that he had before has now changed. It doesn't mean that they're not friends. It doesn't mean that they're not brothers. But what he began to realize is, is that he had to separate himself. He had to make the decision to separate himself if he was really trying to move to where God is trying to take him. Does this sound familiar? Maybe this is where God has some of us. Where it may not be a, a person. It may be a thing. And so sometimes God will challenge us where we have to part of the saint, this, this, this sanctifying process. This consecration process where we really have to think, maybe God got me to a point where some things I need to be separated from in order for me to move to what God has for me. Consecration means separation. It means take off the old man and make preparations to put on a new man. It means some things I can't do any longer. In some places I just can't go any longer. Because consecration means separation. Consecration means changing some things. Consecration means preparation. That's all part of preparation. What is it that I'm preparing for? I'm preparing for where God is trying to take me. I'm preparing for God's blessings. I'm preparing for my assignment. And so this is where Joshua is telling the people as they make preparations to go into this crossover, a place where God has already had prepared for them, a place where they're going to be used for the furtherance of the kingdom. But they had to do some things before they got there. And I want to end by saying maybe this is where God has you. I don't know. But I feel within my spirit. That this word was for somebody. 
where you really have to take time and ask yourself, where is it that God is trying to take me? What do I need to do to make preparation to where God is trying to take me? I trust and believe that God will show you as you begin to open your heart. Would you pray, pray with me, please? God, thank you for your word again. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you, God, for challenging us about our focus. God, I pray, God, that you will help us to stay all, all forever focused on you. Focus on your power. Focus on your presence as you provide the pathway. And then, God, I pray that you will help us, Lord God, to be honest about consecration. Consecration is tough. But God, sometimes you put us in this predicament so that you can give us to where to get us to where you want us to get us. So God, I pray that you, the word that has been brought forth will permeate the depths of the soul of someone right now. And I pray, God, that they will really take a reflection and do the proper changes that they need in order for them to go to where God has them. We thank you for your word. We give you all glory. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.